whatever is the expectation, that's exactly what you have to deliver. Not left of that, not right of that, not more, not less. Exactly what what you're expected to do. With the creativity, it's a um, it's a little bit limited. So you can be limited. creative and you know do film scores and all of them. I used to do that, and that's all cool. And uh, it can give you a good income. It can make you feel like people like what you do and, and all that. But but does it really make you feel good as a composer, you know? Does it make you feel like you're redoing the same thing that you have done many times? Or does it make you feel like, oh, I'm reinventing myself every every project, this is something new? Not too often, especially the higher up you go, the more likely you're gonna be uh, hired to do the same thing that you have done in the past. So that's, that's not so good. In my case, I love composition, um, and I, I love to write for movies, but it's not so cool when you're told exactly what to write, and that's just the nature of applied arts, you know, it's, it's film scoring, and you have to apply it to, to the movie, and that's what makes it good, so that's a different, it's a really different route from from uh, the type of composition when you do whatever you, you really want to do. Good to have items from all over the world here. Sometimes people don't realize what they're eating, what it takes. Something coming from Austria? I'm sure this is American. And then... Austria too. Hmm. They have some deal with Austria. When I started uh, teaching and also I was already doing Forgotten Future, all the different concepts. Like, I create what I really want to say musically, put it out, I don't even promote it. Like if someone finds it and they like it, great. If they don't, it's also fine. Just will find either way. And um, it's much more of a two-way thing, not like promoting and pushing uh, something on people that people would be totally fine if they if they never heard about it, right? But they push it on you and then you feel like, oh yeah, that's I really like that, I want to spend money on it. Why don't I'm not doing that? Uh, Put it out, if you like it, you take it, if you don't, then you don't take it. Make our YouTube channel a wonderful experience by bringing a lot more topics into the hallway so we can come to figure out if you have an experience. With music or anything creative you do, if you want to make money, you get involved with the business, the entertainment business, the industry, in one way or another. Uh, unless, of course, you create your own brand, you create your own... Um, kind of true creative product and then people like it because they want to like it not because you promote it and you push it on them it's a very big difference I would much rather have 5,000 fans that absolutely love and understand what I'm doing um, and really appreciate it for what it is than have uh, 5 million fans that are basically paid for by some sponsor and advertise to them and promote to them and then they click the stupid like button on Facebook and I, they can be 5 million of them. If they don't know what I'm doing, they just like blindly clicking or, you know, kind of that's the new trend, so let's like it. No, not for me, thank you. What time did you wake up at? Way too early, actually. I was hoping to get some rest, but so I think uh, oh, like seven twenty or something like that. It's not too bad. Yeah. Well, we had to really do that editing. Um, we had to come up with some th something um, to add to the show. Turns out that I had two extra minutes, and that's really good to fill up fill up with uh, some interesting content. So I ended up. Um, editing voice and bit crush it and um, I think it's gonna be a really interesting intro. I think people at first might think that something's wrong with technology, it's just like, <laughs> you know, noise. Actually part of the performance, part of the content, because the noise is gonna become an unintelligible speech, kind of like a, like a forgotten uh, broadcast from the 50s. It's gonna sound like, and it turns into today's sound and that basically, um, opens the, the set, and then um, the rest happens. So I think it's, it was a worthwhile 
well spent two hours to put into it. It just shouldn't have happened at 3 a.m., but that's just the nature of you know how this, these things go. Today is going to be a very different crowd. Um, what do you expect from the audience? You know, I just want them to, uh, to react, to enjoy the show, because uh, when you see a reaction, then that's when you feel like you're connecting with the audience, and that, that makes it worthwhile to, to play live. Otherwise, they can just, you know, download the music and listen on their own. But, but that's a kind of like a one-way thing, because uh, you don't see their, their reaction, at least not immediately. It's not real time. But to connect with an audience, that's, that's the most important. So, you know, as, as long as um, mm. they enjoy it, I'm good. What type of energy do you plan on bringing? What feel are you trying to... Yeah, it's a good question. Sure. So, yeah, the first track... Um, is um, well, I will start with an intro. So the intro is going to be an ambience, in, ambient intro, and that's the uh, that's really the uh, the fun part of establishing the mood first. And um, I think it, people can take it in two ways. They can either think, well, it's something boring. I should probably walk out and uh, take a bathroom break or something, um, or they can they can feel like, wow, something big is building here, but uh, we have to wait for it. And then uh, we'll have these beat crust sounds over it because that kind of works with the theme of the conference, which is this low bit uh, kind of 80s. You Cartoon. Know, yeah, it's like a, like a really low resolution computer graphics, and so the audio should do the same for the theme. And that's the kind of the start, and that's the feel. But then it goes into um, the last track from the W1 album. Uh, a remix version. I haven't done a, uh, any other mix than the album mix for that, and so this is the first for that first the first time I'm playing that. Um, has some additional parts and playing over it live with uh, some acid uh, lines, and that that's going to be really really cool. And so that's kind of like a kind of a mid mid energy, uh, somewhat uh, happy-ish track. And then uh, after transition, the second track is the Seagraph themes remix version so the the theme for Seagraph I wrote um, actually only a couple weeks ago <laughs> crazy and then which is gonna be playing at the conference but then for the performance the remix version is gonna be something entirely different with more energy big um, electronic stuff breaks and orchestral elements um, and of course live performance over it and so I want people to get up and 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 move for that. That's that's a really high energy track. It has some huge sound, big you know sub hits and and whatnot. So um, hopefully it was gonna, everyone's gonna enjoy that. So what's your strategy for adapting certain tracks to themed pieces such as this one? Like how do you go about finding out what best fits um, this performance? Regardless whether it's a new theme or an existing theme that, that I'm working with, I kind of have to take that and merge it with the Forgotten Future's own kind of brand and old theme. So basically what Forgotten Future is all about and the philosophy is behind it, that's one half. And then in this case, the conference own, conference's own theme is the other half and kind of have to mesh it together and... Still trying to Im implement your own style into oh absolutely i mean that's um, i wouldn't do it otherwise you know that's it that's an important part i think forgotten future is a little bit of a weird concept and it's it's a little bit different and when people take the time to explore it they find a brand new world with you know details that, that take weeks to explore i try to inject it into everything that that i do because that's basically just helps the concept to grow um, and then with this performance, uh, huge reverbs, huge delays, ambient pads, like really dreamy things that basically take you out of this world and put you into somewhere else. That's the forgotten future part. Bitcrust sounds are, that's kind of for the conference's theme. I'm very curious how people will, will react, it, especially forgotten future fans, because they are not here for the conference, so it's gonna be something new for them. How do you choose sounds when trying to fit them best with, you know, your persona? What sort of sounds catch your ear more than others? I actually um, prefer to to create more the dreamy stuff. 
I don't know, it really depends on, on uh, the track, the concept for the track too. Uh, try to come up with sounds that are warm, full, and make you feel somehow. You know, it's not just like a technical trick that, oh, oh that sounded cool. I mean, I have those, but those are small parts. Really, what, where the feel comes from is, is more these really carefully designed pads and things that emotionally connect with the audience and even just one sound can make you feel even just one note actually uh, without any chords you know any harmonies it can make you feel like somehow connected uh, to that sound it connects with you on a deeper level um, but I think you can do that actually with sound design and with, with textures all the sounds that I use I design from ground up there's nothing wrong with presets if they work, but you have less control. If you design a sound from scratch, you know exactly what it's doing and you can control it better. And yeah, so I think the, the whole point is, uh, what I enjoy in it is making people feel in a way they never felt before, because that is powerful. If you feel like you go to um, a certain you know, performance or, or, or you're, you, you see a movie and it makes you feel in a way, that um, uh, you have experienced before, that's cool, that's entertaining, but then when you leave, it's gone. Um, or you remember it as, you know, like a generic feel, kind of like, yeah, it was really cool, it was really happy, or it was really sad. But a real experience is when, you've, when the music and sounds can make you feel in a way that uh, it's almost like you realize that you have felt something new, and that's an event. Like that's, that can be an event, for that year or that maybe even in your life. That's the part I like. I don't have any agenda. I've had my, my days of uh, scoring movies and releasing albums, very different ones before. I had access to a, a huge audience, um, but I'm not trying to tap into that or use that. You know, I don't think it would be honest. This is not about you know, pushing a message out onto people. Even though some people, I've, <laughs> I've gotten this uh, from a few people that Forgotten Future feels like a, like a re religion or something because of the, the concept behind it. And then I always, always tell people that, you know what, um, it's a concept which you can share, you, you might not share, it's definitely not a religion for several reasons. One, I don't take anyone's money. Two, I haven't killed anyone uh, for not uh, joining my views. I'm not gonna knock on your door trying to convince you to, uh, to buy my album. So it's definitely not a religion. But it, it is a message and if, if it resonates with someone, great. If it doesn't, that's totally fine. We can just enjoy the music. <laughs>